It's a beautiful Tuesday here in Trinidad and Tobago. It's a bit cloudy. I'm not entirely sure if that is uh, hopefully rain or if it's a hard dust, though. I was made aware yesterday the concentration is higher than normal. But with a bit of rain this morning, maybe that uh, quells it a bit or it just turns it into mud that is going to uh, splash on your freshly washed car. Yes, let me not depress you this morning. In fact, Welcome to Talking Point here on WESN. I'm Keaton Shaw, and uh, we're doing things a bit different on Talking Point this morning, where usually we would cover a plethora of local topics, but we will be exploring crises around the world and linking it back to the situation here in Trinidad and Tobago. Let me introduce my co-host and colleague who's alongside me this morning, Mr. Sean Michael Small. Good morning, Sean. Good morning, Keith. And yes, you say that it's a nice day. It's a it, it's a beautiful day today. Technically speaking, oh, not, most great. people won't, 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 won't agree with you. I will agree with you. I always said I prefer overcast days to, to sunny days. It's nice and cool. Um, I know we're going international. I just want to do a quick update because we spoke about it with regards to the officer's attempts to find the suspect in the murder of Officer Gilks at the time, the believed suspect. Um, that Friday, they maybe, I guess it's been reported that the PCA has said that the officers who went into a mosque in Rich Plain, well, they might have violated their rights and, and could face charges. Um, to what extent now, the, the, the frustrating thing with the process is the PCA takes the complaint, they do investigations, then they have to pass it on because the authority is only so much. But um, while it might seem a little bit of a piling on on the TTPS, it was something that, that we were wondering about even as it happened with regards to the incident um, that officers were futilely tearing up Digger Martin for a suspect when the, the facts of the case were totally different. Sometimes all you have to do is look in the mirror. It's simple. But also with us this morning uh, via the Zoom platform is uh, our colleague, Tuesday commentator. Uh, welcome back to the program, former youth parliamentarian, Camille Pascal. Good morning, Camille. Good morning, Kitan. Uh, good morning to Sean as well, and good morning to all of you us this morning. Well, as we uh, seek to discuss what's taking place uh, at various parts of the globe, uh, let me start off by sharing with you all, which probably you might be aware of already, that uh, Trinidad and Tobago, well, this is the 12th day of the month of July, and thus far we've recorded 38 murders, thus far for the month. In fact, it's just over three murders recorded per day on average. Now with that, if this continues on course to what we're mathematically actually uh, estimating it to be, we're looking at over 90 murders for the month of July. That's if trends continues. That will not only be the bloodiest month for the year of 2022 thus far, but the bloodiest month in the history of Trinidad and Tobago, at least since we started recording murders here in our beloved Twin Island Republic. And why do I raise that as the first topic? Because with a surge in gang violence and criminal activity across Trinidad and Tobago, especially, as I mentioned, gang violence and the power of the gangs, especially with the weaponry that they hold within their hands and their ability to carry out these crimes, fueled with, uh, how do I put this, Sean? A rather depressing criminal justice system. All we have to do is look across the Caribbean to a French nation, also a member of CARICOM, in which the situation that is unfolding there could somehow see Trinidad and Tobago ending up in a similar position in the future, because we're not very far off. I speak with no other country than Haiti. Yes, Haiti, and of course, they're still dealing with the fallout from the assassination of their president, from the arrests of the people involved, investigating the case, investigating the prime minister. So we have a clip um, with regards to the ongoing, well, destabilization of the country. That's probably the best way to try to sum it up. Let's take a look at what's going on in Haiti. Today in Haiti, a memorial marking one year since President Jovenel Moise was assassinated. Protesters demanding answers. 
Jovenel Moïse, justice sociale pour le peuple It comes as the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights says armed violence has reached unimaginable and intolerable levels in Haiti. Last month, a gang took over the country's largest port and set files on fire. This has become daily life here in Haiti. Tires burning on city streets, protesters furious at the government's inability to confront kidnappers. Since we reported from Port-au-Prince last year following the kidnapping of 17 missionaries, the desperation in Haiti has grown more dire. Fuel shortages, gang violence, labor strikes. In some parts of the country, all-out lawlessness. The director of this hospital told us medical personnel live in fear of being abducted. They're very scared and we are trying to provide some training about anticipating some some alert signs to avoid. From January to March of this year, there were 225 reported kidnappings in Haiti, a 58 percent jump from the same period last year. In April and May, the U.N. says 16,000 people have been displaced and 1,700 schools have been forced to shut down, leaving half a million children out of their classrooms. As for investigations into Moise's assassination, there have been few clear answers. The U.S. Justice Department alleges that a group of about 20 Colombian nationals and a group of Haitian Americans participated in the plot that was initially focused on kidnapping Moise, but ultimately ended up killing him. In Haiti, 18 jailed suspects, ex-Colombian soldiers, have not stood trial yet. La justice doit continuer à faire le maximum pour traquer les coupables. Another suspect, Prime Minister Ariel Henry himself. The New York Times reporting that phone records indicate he spoke with another man accused of masterminding the plot. Henry has denied wrongdoing. <laughs> The Justice Department has asked a Miami court to stop testimony from one of the extradited suspects from being made public because it may contain classified information. All right, Gabe Gutierrez joins us now on set. And Gabe, I know NBC News has some additional new reporting about the immigration crisis with Haiti and the U.S. right now and a change in policy. Yeah, that's right, Tom. According to an internal planning document obtained by NBC News, the Biden administration is allowing more Haitians to stay in the U.S. and seek asylum if they come through a legal port of entry. Now, previously, you might remember, Tom, many Haitians were being flown back to Haiti uh, if they came to the U.S. But now the Biden administration is trying to incentivize those Haitians to go through a legal port of entry instead of trying to cross undetected. That report, courtesy of the of NBC News, and some stark statistics. I mean, one that might seem small: sixteen thousand displaced. So that essentially is sixteen thousand were made homeless, from my understanding, just in their country. Um, that is probably on a much greater scale than any disasters that we have seen here in TNT. But even more importantly, 500,000 lost access to education. Yes, yes. That's one third of our population. So this is one of the things that I think we need to understand. When we speak about other Caribbean nations, we speak about islands with populations around our size or much smaller. With Haiti, with 11 million people, the scope or the scale of the disaster is well out of proportion that of what you would expect with most Caribbean countries. Well, gang violence has obviously plagued this socio-economic area of Haiti, which is Port-au-Prince, this metropolitan uh, area. It's spread fear and terror among the population, and it's estimated that there are over 200 gangs in Port-au-Prince alone, with roughly 3,000 soldiers. Now, they have actually been blocking uh, road access to various routes, which has impacted upon schools, hospitals, and essential services. In fact, the southern peninsula of Haiti has been almost completely blocked off, which is roughly 3.8 million people being left alone. And with half, over half the population already malnourished and suffering from a food crisis with inflation rising, rising to 26% on average due to the crisis, well, Haiti is in dire need of support. But exactly in this time, the global economy and the global crisis coming out of the COVID-19 pandemic. Who is now going to be Haiti's savior once more? Kemuel, Haiti seems to have lost the, the, the gem. It was once touted as the gem of the Caribbean. 
long ago it was touted as a gem of the Caribbean. It was, in fact, at one point in time, one of the richest countries in the Western Hemisphere. Haiti, throughout history, has now fallen. And it seems as though international nations have lost interest in supporting Haiti. Yeah, I think, I think that's, that's exactly the issue um, here because it's, I mean, for, for some international nations, it's how much more support can you really offer to Haiti. But I know for us in the Caribbean, it's slightly different because Haiti, um, while not exact, while, while a member of CARICOM, they are you know, the silver nation uh, within CARICOM. So the status and the privilege that is afforded to other nations uh, within the CARICOM region in terms of support or help um, after natural disasters or even just general violence or things that we are seeing um, right now in Haiti is not really offered to them that we would the support that we offer to other nations within CARICOM, we don't necessarily offer it to, to Haiti. So really and truly how much more can can Haiti can Haiti take? How much more can how much more things can they can they really get based on what they are already experiencing right now? Now uh, Haiti actually is uh, rich in gold. It's estimated that uh, Haiti has roughly twenty billion dollars U.S. Mm. in deposits of gold. Now they they're also rich in in, in uh, uh, high quality deposits of copper and other minerals, including calcium carbonate, um, which the United States it, it at least used to actually import from Haiti roughly two point five million tons annually. Now with Haiti only having what is believed to be gold, with the loss of its natural resources in copper, calcium, um, calcium carbonate, it seems as though because Haiti is now lacking natural resources, and this is an argument that we've made in international relations before, wherever there is oil, a country will always, uh, oil or natural gas, a country will always seek interest, and will do it for the betterment of that nation through democracy. It seems as though that's not taking place anymore. Well, so you mentioned with regards to our um, criminal justice system. Haiti has a similar problem. Uh, in June, a gang actually took over a courthouse and burned documents and, and seized evidence. And when those sorts of things happen, you already now take the criminal justice system and, and, and that, that's a whole new level of problems that fortunately, I think, we do not have to suffer through. So Camille's point is correct. Um, Haiti is the island in the region that seems to be under constantly the most strain. And not only is there Haiti, but then there's also Cuba, then there's also Venezuela. And I honestly don't, like Cuba, I kind of understand a little bit how their economy was going. They just continued at their, at their pace with, with their communist system. I don't understand what's going on or how Haiti and Venezuela is surviving and being in the region. You know, the risk, because um, the populations are so large, w what are you going to do? You're going to leave them to starve or you're going to, you, ca you can't take them all on ourselves. We, 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 we already saw that with Venezuela, right? Haiti will be the same thing. So everybody's going to the United States, but the United States can't take 11 million people just like that and expect everything to be fine. That's a recipe for disaster. That's a recipe for, 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 refugee camps and, and, and lack of employment and crime in the refugee camps. So, Well, adding to that, the United States has also indicated, um, and through the Under Secretary of State, Wendy Sherman, that they've allocated U.S. $48 million in additional security assistance through the United States Department of State Bureau of Narcotics and Law Enforcement to help bolster security across the island nation. Now, going back to what you were saying, Sean, the judicial system, the gang violence, and what we're seeing taking place. This is a conversation I think that uh, at least Sean has been raising over the last couple of weeks. And it's very, very important because we're linking it back now to what we're seeing taking place in Trinidad and Tobago. That is why I started the conversation with the fact that we've had 38 murders in the first 12 days of July, and we're heading down a bloody path a very, very bloody path. Adding to that, gangs in Trinidad and Tobago seem to get away. I mean, if the Scrap Iron Dealers Association president could label Trinidad and Tobago as the land of the lawless, and even our callers have stated there is no law and order in Trinidad and Tobago, the judicial system here has collapsed as far as I'm concerned. Cases are absolutely sluggish and slow, and at the same time, it seems as though our politicians are more and more, they just, more concerned with inflicting political hate at each other. Kemuel, 
it seems as though Trinidad and Tobago is not too far behind, although we haven't fallen into the abyss just as yet. I kind of I kinda try to, how to put it? It's, it's kind of hard to think about the fact that things that are happening in other nations and looking at the way in which, in the way how the, those other nations ended up in a, the particular situation that they are in right now and uh, linking back to Trinidad and Tobago, it's always, especially being a citizen living living in Trinidad and Tobago, it's always kind of a hard reality. But let's be real, people would say, a lot of people, probably all viewers right now are looking at us and saying, why are they even having this conversation? Why, why are they speaking so badly about Trinidad and Tobago? But if we're being real, some of the things which are happening in places like Haiti and other nations around the world that are facing economic turmoil, when we look at it and we compare to Trinidad and Tobago, it's exactly the same thing that we are seeing. So it's it's us it's for us to have the hard conversations and it's while it's very sobering, that's just a fact. The things that are happening right now, similar things we are seeing here in Trinidad and Tobago. Yeah, I mean you and Camille more or less said it the resources when resources in Haiti run out. Lawlessness in Haiti, what what happens? And we're seeing the signs of similar hair, it's not as bad, necessarily, but why, why are we going to wait for it to get that bad exactly. before we do something about it? Exactly, and as we conclude on this particular topic, uh, Haiti's criminal justice system is seen as completely dysfunctional and very much corrupt, only benefiting citizens with money as well as political agendas. In fact, one case that was documented by France 24 shows one citizen who's claimed innocence for sexually assaulting a woman who's been in prison for the last two years and is yet to actually appear before magistrate. So, Sounds familiar. <laughs> again, you're absolutely right. Uh, you see why we're pointing out these things. People might think we're selfish, but there is a lot behind it and a lot of similarities that we're seeing here in TNT. Folks, we're going to take a break here now on the program. And when we return... We continue the conversations looking at the situation in another country. Knowing how to tell authentic is as easy as one, two, three. Find it, match it, search it. Step one, find the style number on the tag. Step two, match the style number inside the jersey with the number on the tag. Step three, search it. A quick Google search of the style number will verify the jersey is authentic when the search results match the jersey being searched. Don't be fooled by counterfeit jerseys. Before you buy, remember to find it, match it, search it. Fan Zone, two locations nationwide, Center City Mall, Chaguanas, and Movie Town, Port of Spain. Nationwide delivery available. The best way to get are at thebesttoys.com. Shop for the best brands you love at the best prices. Like VTech, LeapFrog, Fisher-Price, Play-Doh, Hot Wheels, Bobby, Coco Melon, LOL, Baby Alive, Crayola. Visit us in-store at Forces Flagship Mac Bean. Shop online now at dbesttoys.com. Order via call or WhatsApp at 32 dbest to order. And remember, we have the best toys at the best prices. There's a taste in the air everywhere. Feel the vibe cause it's something to share. Smooth, rich and creamy, you'll find it right here. Makes you smile, relax a while, it's fun and the chair. Ooh, enjoy every scoop. Ooh, every taste will get you hooked. We have flavors that you love, a combination special. Come along, enjoy our treats. This is Uncle Pete's. Welcome back to Talking Point here on WASN. So we started off with Haiti, we've ended there, and now we're traveling across the world to the Asian Pacific island nation of Sri Lanka. Now, Sri Lanka is the first 
nation since 1970, actually, uh, to limit the sale of oil and gas to the public. Right. And I think it's something that we might not really appreciate because we are traditionally an oil producing nation. That doesn't necessarily mean we produce the gasoline that we drive, but it has changed the equation for us. Sri Lanka doesn't have that luxury. So now they're an example of what life could be like for us when we more or less get to that point. So let's take a look at the first clip with regards to their fuel crisis that they've been having for quite a few weeks now. An endless struggle for this island nation. Queues that go on and on and on. Sri Lanka's running out of fuel and of hope. With only days of petrol left in the country, all they can do is wait. At the front of the line, taxi driver Ajivan. You're number one in the queue. How long have you been waiting? Uh, two days, maybe. Two days? Yeah. Uh, I've been sleeping in my taxi. Sometimes I leave to get food. Then I come back here and sleep. That's how I've been living in the last few days. I can only survive if I have fuel. Here the pumps are dry. With no international shipments due for at least two weeks, what's left in the country is being rationed. These tiny pieces of paper have become one of the most sought after things in Sri Lanka. They're fuel tokens and everybody in this stretch of the line could be waiting days just to get one. And once you have one in your hand, you then have to wait for your petrol station to say that they have supplies of fuel. Now the owner of this particular token got it on Tuesday and his local station says he still don't have any fuel for him to pump. Near the end of the queue, we find Jayantha. He drove here from his village, using up fuel in the hope of finding more. Can't live without gas, petrol, everything. We, know, we know, need everything, but it's difficult not supplying continuously. That's why we are in a deep trouble in here now. And that's led to deep frustration and anger towards the government. The country's president's appeal to Russia for help. A delegation's due in Moscow at the weekend to discuss the purchase of cheap oil for this nation. Do you usually ride bikes? I buy the not Back at the queue, Jagannathan's just bought his first ever bike to get around. Now, no petrol, no diesel, everything. Bicycle very expensive. The cost of cycles has tripled. Inflation's at more than 50%. Sri Lanka's economic crisis keeps getting worse. How long must they wait? For things to get better. Regina Vardinathan, BBC News, Colombo. That report courtesy of the BBC and of course some of those lines there, I don't even think the report did it justice. Now, the situation as you could imagine is not something we have, I don't think most of us have even experienced anything quite like it. So the response to it now from the people being stuck in a line to get gas that you can't leave because you don't have enough fuel to drive away. For days on end, that response has resulted in the, well, the leadership of the country being demanded by the people to step down. So let's take a look at our next clip, the current protests, where the people are more or less occupying, I believe, the president's residence. Anger over Sri Lanka's economic crisis is boiling over. Hundreds of people broke into the presidential palace after more than 100,000 protesters took to the streets demanding that the president resign. They blame him for economic mismanagement that has led to shortages of food, fuel and medicine. Police say at least 31 people, including two officers, have been injured, two of them critically. CNN Sophia Saifi joins me now from Karachi, Pakistan for more. So Sophia, a long smoldering political powder keg seems to have gone off in Sri Lanka. What's the latest? 
Well, Kim, what we're hearing from people on the ground in Colombo is is that this kind of came to a head uh, early uh, this afternoon. Uh, the police curfew that had been in place on Friday evening uh, was lifted at eight in the morning. Uh, the whereabouts of the president, uh, Rajapaksa, is unknown. Uh, we still don't know where he is. Not many people do. He's been taken away for his own safety, uh, allegedly. Uh, we do know that these are scenes of euphoria. These protesters had been parked outside, camped outside the presidential palace for months, calling for him to resign, calling for him to go. And now you've seen over 100,000, these incredible scenes uh, of over 100,000 people to storm in uh, to this iconic presidential palace uh, in the fort area of Colombo, right next to the port, right in front of the naval headquarters. Uh, just a situation that is ongoing, uh, coming to a head, like I said, weeks and weeks of calling for his resignation. Kim? Yeah, scenes of chaos, euphoria, as you say. I mean, some of the scenes there are incredible to see protesters actually swimming in the, the presidential uh, swimming pool. Uh, but l explain what's behind all of this anger that has been going on for quite some time. Yes, Kim. I mean, there has been a complete and utter breakdown of Sri Lanka's economy. The country was announced as being bankrupt uh, only a couple of days ago. There had been kind of sputtering talks uh, with the IMF. Nothing had come to a fore. There have been, uh, you know, there, there's been a fuel crisis. There's been a food crisis. There's been a medicine crisis. Uh, the worst economic crisis that the country has faced in over seven decades. A country that has been battered uh, economically by what happened during the pandemic. Pandemic, uh, because of poor economic management, because of wider global trends uh, that have caused this to happen. And the, the, the kind of protests that we've seen uh, in Sri Lanka have been unprecedented. They've been spread out throughout the country. Uh, these are people who have been nonviolent, have been united, have been very organized, and again, has led to what we've seen, these scenes uh, unfold in the capital city of Sri Lanka. Kim? All right, we'll stay on top of this uh, developing story. Sophia Saifi live for us in Karachi. Thanks so much. That report, courtesy CNN, just shows what happens when things actually hit rock bottom. I said, well, you know, don't wait until it does. This is what happens when it does actually reach that point. The people don't really have much they could do except hope that maybe a change could eventually turn things around and hope that the change will happen sooner rather than later. But as it stands right now, you know, the situation in Sri Lanka, that has also devolved. And we need to understand that, again, we see some of the same signs. Food prices rising. Potentially, we're going to see shortages if this continues. We're already seeing shortages. And we're already seeing shortages of certain items. And the breakdown the protests we saw the other day, that was one incident. It could easily be repeated again, depending on how things go. Well, uh, Camille, I'm coming to you because uh, of a nation of 22 million people, it's interesting that inflation has risen to roughly 50% in Sri Lanka. Now, when you look at uh, their foreign reserves, they actually do not have any great export. Their main source of foreign income was through tourism. And of course, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, that was limited over two years. Uh, at the end of 2019, they, they had roughly uh, 7 billion US dollars in foreign exchange reserves. At the end of 2020, that dropped to just over 1 billion. And the government recently stated that they have just about 50 million US dollars left in foreign reserves. And that is very scary. Uh, this is the thing. They import oil and gas. And Trinidad and Tobago, to a certain degree, is now doing that. We're no longer fully dependent on the resources that we have naturally, but we've now actually had to import in order to supplement our situation. Exactly. It's, it's essentially a, uh, a tale where we're seeing what was happening in, in Sri Lanka. Like, is this is almost taking place in Trinidad and Tobago. Because um, when, I, when, I, when I did my research on, on the country and what, is, what exactly is happening, because I have been following the story, in fact, in, in 2019, 22% of their GDP uh, con was accounted within their budget. And obviously, with COVID, that, that basically dried up things. They have a situation with their forex, as you mentioned, um, and they have a, a situation where they import more than, than they even export. So they have a, what's called an, a deficit, an import deficit um, 
in that regard to the point where they had to now stop exporting tea to the uk as much as they normally um that as much as they did in the past and a whole host of other situations which have basically um brought them to this particular point we have a situation where um just back in 2016 alone they will be a lot um the sum of 1.6 billion dollars by the imf and so even when they look at uh, recovering from the situation that they are in right now is that there are certain conditions that the IMF wants them to meet in order for um, them to even get any form of bail up. But it's a situation that we're seeing similar things taking place in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, they have a lot of family hirings within the Rajapaksa-led um, government. And similar things we see here in Trinidad and Tobago where it's basically people within your circle or government contract kick, uh, kickbacks um, they, they, they had reached a point where they were taking loans to repay loans and then they also they were ultimately brought to, to the ground earlier this year when they basically um, defaulted on their loans. They said, here, so we, we can't pay anymore. Well, a lot, sorry, of that, yeah. a lot of that just sounds familiar, right? Like we hear shades of that. Not so. Taking loans to repay loans, we're afraid that that might happen. Government kickbacks and excess, we're afraid that that might happen. And I think we need to not underestimate the fact that even when the ship is sinking, there will be those that will still want to extract as much as they can for themselves and maybe just jump the ship when it, when it finally sinks. And two other aspects of this. Sri Lanka was by no means a poor country. In fact, in 2019, when you look at uh, adjusted per capita GDP, they actually had a higher per capita GDP when compared to South Africa, Indonesia, Peru, just to name some countries. And South Africa is a big one there because they have their own, to some extent, small defense industry. They're part of BRICS. Yes. So that's not a, a mine. And, and that is key, by the way, that they were part of BRICS. But also, to add to this, let's look at two tenants, gentlemen. The two main tenants is, first of all, a £2.5 billion loan from the IMF, a three billion US dollar loan. But the IMF has indicated if you want to take any loan, even if it's for a bailout, you have to raise taxes and interest rates. The other aspect of this is food. And this is very, very key and important, especially when we're relating it to Trinidad and Tobago. Sri Lanka over the years became so dependent on importing food that they actually had food imports of roughly three billion dollars annually. Exports were nothing compared. Kemuel himself just pointed out that their main product that they're, they're renowned for, Ceylon tea, they had to cut that export to the United Kingdom. So food imports became so heavy, the government simply couldn't afford it. Added to that, they are heavily in debt to China for what some analysts have indicated is unnecessary infrastructural needs and desires just put forward by government oh unnecessary i mean we don't have anything like that here no 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 like an airport that we don't need because our tourist industry and tourism sector is more or less like the red-headed stepchild that never gets any sort of development has no demands on the system and it has no potential return of investment with regards to the amount of money being spent on this new airport in tobago no we have none of that here but this is exactly the point as much as you know, my course was being sarcastic. He was right in doing so. Because you have to remember, Kemal, coming back to you as we conclude yep. this topic, you have to remember Sri Lanka, again, they, didn't, they imported oil and gas. Foreign exchange was depleted over the years. It's almost zero right now. On top of which, uh, food imports as compared to exports were astronomical. They actually didn't diversify within the economy, so they actually couldn't feed the 22 million population. And then added to that, their main source of income, which was tourism, depleted. Camille, I think we just described Trinidad and Tobago, but we're speaking about Sri Lanka. Sure, to a large extent, not only that, their agriculture sector was essentially decimated when um, the prime minister attempted to move totally to an organic state of agriculture, yes. become the first country in the world. And that, that did a lot for farmers. Uh, many farmers described that as 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 basically the decimation of the agricultural sector in in um in in Sri Lanka. Not only that, there was also the the the, the very big promise by the prime minister um, a couple of years ago where he would cut taxes. And so even whilst they were in a state of of needing money, even at that particular point, the prime minister kept good on his promise and he 
cut all taxes well not all taxes but majority of taxes and so that the country needed money and them not even being being able to pay their loans and now with the lack of taxes which would have brought in some amount of income that basically worsened the situation um in the country of sri lanka till the point where where they are right now one thing though the imf is saying um raise taxes and um, interest rates and interest rates Greece was the poster child of austerity measures not working. And from yeah. Greece came the idea, well, deficit, just go into more deficit. And if, you, and if growth could, 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 could stay ahead of deficits and loans, then you'll be fine. So it, it's interesting. I'm not sure if economists really know the best way out of some of these situations because the world is not, it's, it, it's, a, new, it's a whole new realm, I well, think, economically. You see what, ter- what happened to Theresa May? when she tried to raise, just raise the conversation of austerity measures in the United Kingdom. That alone speaks a lot. But as we conclude this conversation, ladies and gentlemen, this is why we're having this discussion. There are a lot of similarities and tenants to what is taking place outside of Trinidad and Tobago, which has led to the collapse of economies and nations around the world. We're going to take a break here on the program. And when we read soon, we travel again from the Asian Pacific country of Sri Lanka to Europe. Stay tuned. Ocho. 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 Organic Ocho Candy. What's inside counts. As I run through the day, there's one thing that I need to give me more smiles and motivation to lead, to make new memories and nutrition to grow. My kiss and rich brand, the best taste that I know. Fill your day with love. Free to live with the best for you. All across the nation to make your move. Every day and delivered nationwide. Kiss and rich bread. Fill your day with love. Let your voice be heard. Call Madam Fix It on WESN, the only place that effectively helps you with your woes. Having problems getting onto government agencies, water woes, NIS and pension problems, potholes, and much, much more. Call me, Madam Fixit, every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, right here on WESN. Let me fix it for you. The issue, the continued rise in the price of flour and its impact on the cost of living in Trinidad and Tobago. How should we go about it? I want to ask you what has been revealed to you about the state of vulnerability in the country because of, of this exercise and because of, of what we're going through. Is the government losing the war on the vaccine front? The discussion should revolve around the common good for the greatest number of people in Trinidad and Tobago. How do we inculcate a sense of respect and regard for people who may not be of your own political ilk or persuasion. The communities are not being used by political opportunists. So yeah. I, I when the I tables accept. are turned, when the tables are turned, it's the same. It's the same way. Okay, this has been ten questions. I'm Andy Johnson, and we we'll see you next time. Is it politics? What is? It? Is it that nobody cares about sports? The kind of support that sport used to get in the past is, is no longer here. The thing is, taking a knee doesn't mean that that's the only thing you're doing, Andy. Right. Taking a knee along with other stuff. Samantha, what are you looking forward to when you return home to Trinidad and Tobago after winning the title? 
Thank you very much for speaking it into existence. Is there no pressure on Nicholas Ball? It makes me more motivated to work hard and to go out there and rep the red, white and black. Why are we sending a team to the Winter Olympics? There are a number of Trinbegonians who are in the diaspora and have grown up in winter sport. It's an opportunity that the Trinidad and Tobago Olympic Committee will not close the door. I also believe in the players that we have. Once you can motivate the players, you can get the best out of them. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Talking Points. So we go from economic disaster and we move to political disaster. In the UK, the Prime Minister Boris Johnson, for all intents and purposes, he is a caretaker for the last couple of weeks as his party now seeks to elect a new leader. We have a report from Al Jazeera, which will more or less give us some details with regards to how that political process is going, and then we'll discuss more about the fallout. Politics is a brutal business riven with rivalries and shifting loyalties and simmering ambitions. And when the top job is up for grabs, the heat really is on. It looks like it's shaping up to be a very, a very kind of nasty leadership campaign. If that does happen, of course, whoever wins will be providing over a very fractured party at a point at which we're going through a once in a lifetime cost of living crisis. The UK's next Prime Minister isn't chosen by the general public. Instead, just Conservative MPs over there in Parliament will whittle the list down, most likely to just two remaining candidates, and then the Conservative Party membership in the country, around 160,000 of them, will cast their postal ballots. A 2019 analysis found that 70% of the members are male, 56% are older than 55, and a third of them live in London and the southeast of England. Expect policies which appeal explicitly or implicitly to that demographic. The Conservative Party models itself as the party for business. Conservative voters generally don't support high taxes. They inhibit enterprise and growth, they believe. So it's no surprise that at this early stage of the contest, the leadership rivals are falling over themselves to promise tax cuts. Look, I believe in a lower tax, uh, lower regulation, cut the red tape uh, economy. I think no Conservative should raise taxes either. Um, what you need are smart tax cuts that will grow the economy. I've always been a low tax Conservative and I'm delighted that others are following. And whatever you decide on economic policy has risk, whichever way you go. But there, I think the much greater risk is not having the tax cuts. But if you're cutting taxes, how will you fund public services? Nearly 6.5 million patients are currently waiting for hospital treatment in England, such as knee replacements or eye surgery. And the next PM needs to have a plan. Low wage growth, big increases in energy bills and price inflation nudging into double figures have all created a cost of living crisis here in the UK, something the new prime minister is gonna to have to tackle. First and foremost, the people who are suffering the most in this country, of course, are those who are vulnerable. 2.6 million kids going hungry. You just send more cash to them directly. On the other side, you also need to have a serious program for how we're going to fix this country and fix our problems. Remember, this is an election in which only Conservatives can vote. The other 47 million people of voting age can only watch and wait and hope for the best. Paul Brennan, Al Jazeera, London. Two things from that Al Jazeera report. One, of course, is the fact that, well, revenue, tax cuts might be popular, but revenue to continue with government services, that is a question that we seem to be constantly debating here in TNT with regards to where we're going to spend the money. As well as two of the candidates, that's interesting. They just resigned <laughs> from their cabinet and got the ball rolling. Politically speaking, they, mo they, 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 they moved away from supporting their then political leader, well, the and most, now they're vying for his job. The most, uh, actually, the most popular uh, candidate right now to replace Boris Johnson, which seems to be Rishi Sunak, at least that's according to media reports, was the first to resign from his party. Hint, hint, wink, wink. Anyway, uh, let us get into this conversation now because there are a couple of things there. The, where this particular video ended, uh, he stated that tax cuts are obviously very popular. Any nation wants tax cuts. But there's 6.5 million people waiting to access public health care in the United Kingdom. 
Bear in mind, their population is far greater as compared to Trinidad and Tobago. And how many people now in TNT are waiting to access public health care? Because as much as we hear from the Minister of Health on a daily basis in relation to COVID-19, I think we've actually forgotten our basic medical system. Uh, we, we, we've not prioritized that. And we're coming out of the COVID-19 phase. Adding to that, there has been no wage growth in the United Kingdom. And people are now frustrated and worried because as much as you're cutting taxes, prices have risen due to inflation. There's one other aspect of it, which we've actually seen in Haiti and Sri Lanka, which I'll get into very shortly with Camille. It's, it's amazing this morning how Trinidad and Tobago seems to be very, very fortunate. It, it just seems to be sheer luck that we're able to stay afloat. At least that's what we're being told because we don't know what's the actual situation. We don't have accurate data and statistics. And that's the problem that all economists have. Even those at UE, we have a CSO office that is not functioning properly, that they simply can't even get the bill um, to, to fix that situation through Parliament, which has been in Parliament since before um, the Keith Rowley led administration, even during the People's Partnership tenure. So you see how long. So if we can't get appropriate statistics, we don't necessarily have an idea as to whether or not things are actually the way that we think it is. So we may be thinking that all right, all is well and good. We're actually still able to to be afloat some to some extent, but we don't know the real situation. Well, there are two things. Yeah, you're absolutely right. We don't know the real situation. The, the two, the, one I wanted to mention was food security. I'll get into the details very shortly. But the other thing was scandals associated with the cabinet under Boris Johnson and Boris Johnson not doing anything to deal with the situation, actually basically refusing publicly to deal with the situation, always finding a smart way to try and cover it up. Doesn't that sound very familiar? Uh, uh, by the way, I think we've used that term. Doesn't that sound very familiar? Multiple times mm -hmm, this morning. Mm -hmm. And as also, just remember uh, that that report opened up with the line, the UK's experience of once in a lifetime cost of living crisis. Yes, and so so are we. Obviously, everybody, all nations are experiencing that. So if it could happen there, I mean, it could happen here. Ironically, in this case, the it's basically the finance minister. That's what the chancellor's role is. You know, he left over economic policy uh, disagreements. That could be why he might be the leading candidate because people might be the most confident. Let's put the finance minister in the charge Chancellor, during yeah. an economic crisis as opposed to the health minister or the former health minister. I mean, COVID management is a whole other debate. And, and, and popularity of that is a whole other situation. Well, the other thing, as I, as I was mentioning, was uh, failure to actually pay attention to food security in the United Kingdom because uh, the, the Boris Johnson-led administration actually relied very heavily on food imports, at least during his time that was there, especially after Brexit. Now, with the COVID-19 pandemic coupled with the crisis in Ukraine, the uh, British people are now facing astronomical prices, even more so than what we're facing here in Trinidad and Tobago. If you were to go to the fuel pump this morning in the United Kingdom, chances are you will not be able to afford to fill up even half your tank. That is to tell you what it is like. It's, it's, it's really, really bad out there. But again, a nation such as the United Kingdom, which has had one of the most stable democracies and stable economies since time itself, at least as far as history would show, is now actually reeling due to food security uh, issues. And again, if they aren't able to actually readily supply their population with food, considering that they have been an agricultural society, again, since the beginning of time, what does that say for a small twin island republic of Trinidad and Tobago? Camille. Uh, that, that that's that's a quite interesting perspective, and they are a nation that, as as you said, literally recently came out of Brexit, and they are in Europe a uh, much better performing economy than we are at present. And if they are struggling, I could well imagine a situation that we um, that that we are facing here in Trinidad and Tobago, and not to mention the fact that CARICOM is basically scrambling at this point to implement some sort of, 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 of food security sustainability program uh, by way of the recent um, partnerships with Guyana and the recent um, meeting that they had in Guyana back, I think, was in um, 
early in June, if I'm not, or, or the end of May. So imagine if they are facing that situation, what is the situation that we are facing here in Trinidad and Tobago? And it really speaks to the fact that we have been failed by our leaders over the years because no one has really had the foresight to plan for situations like this. Yes, we did not know that COVID, the COVID pandemic would come and we didn't know we, we have been facing different economic um, situations. And yes, we understand that it, is, that it is compounded by the issues in Ukraine. But at the same time, we must also acknowledge that our leaders over the years have failed to put things in place um, where food security and agriculture is concerned. Now, to be fair, one of the issues that uh, the United Kingdom has is also defense spending with regards to Russia and, and the perception yes. of that threat um, growing. However, one of the things now that we don't have to worry about that directly, but you, the UK is also more or less an oil producing nation as well. They, they, they don't have to worry about energy prices, technically speaking, to some extent, like other nations, except just like TNT, as it turns out, they still kind of have to do. So the, the, the example there, all of the things that in the past might have insulated us from collapse, they more or less seems to be coming into play. Now, we're, we're almost out of time. There's a clip I want both of you all to see, and this is um, the Prime Minister, well, the soon-to-be former Prime Minister, Boris Johnson. I believe this is, might have been one of his first public interviews since more or less calling or, or, or basically informing the nation of his resignation or his intent to resign. So it was interesting to watch, and I think it's something that I don't know if we would see if it was here in TNT. Let's take a look at this clip. Prime Minister, this is the first time uh, we've seen you since you agreed to stand down last week. You went from Chogham, G7, NATO to this dragging out, being dragged out of number 10 in the most dramatic of fashions. Uh, I'm, I'm a bit shell-shocked by all of it. How, how are you feeling now? I'm, abs I'm determined to just get over the number one message today, which is about investment in science in technology. PM, I'm, I'm, I'm sure viewers will be watching this. As you said yourself, there are 40 million of them that voted for you in, in 2019. Your, your sister, Rachel, said on the radio last night that this was a huge loss for you. She said, I know it's a huge loss for him, a huge loss that's almost like a bereavement. Well, I, I did Rake say that. Well, my, my sister's a wonderful, uh, a wonderful journalist. I think that uh, what I should really concentrate on now, and you're, you're right, you know, I'm, I'm uh, doing the last uh, few days, weeks, or however long it is, but the job of government has got to be carried on in that period. In your statement, just talking about the party made their decision, you, you talked about the herd in Westminster. You said when it moves, it moves, and it certainly stampeded on you last week. Do you feel betrayed? No, I, I, I don't want to you say I, any more about it or that. There's a, there's a contest underway and that must happen, and you know, I would wish, wouldn't want to damage anybody's chances by offering my support. I just have to, Not to a get on. Of I, anger. I have to get on and in the last few days and weeks, the, the job of the constitutional function of the Prime Minister in this in this situation is to is to discharge uh, the mandate, to continue to discharge the mandate. Uh, and, and that's what I'm doing. Just to be clear, you are not uh, putting your hat uh, or putting your horse behind any of the runners and riders. I, I should, I, it would be, that's not the job of the Prime mm. Minister at this stage. The job of the Prime Minister at this stage uh, is to let the party uh, decide, let them, let them get on with it and to continue uh, delivering on the, the, the projects that we uh, were elected to, to deliver. Mm. That's, so that's my Minister, sermon for today. You're going well, to that... go down as one of the shortest serving Prime Ministers in history, despite winning an 80 seat majority in 2019. But despite it all, you're putting on a brave face. Well, I'm, I, I'm, I'm determined to uh, get on and uh, deliver the, uh, the mandate that, that, was, uh, that was given to us. But my, my job is really just to uh, oversee the, the process for the next few weeks and I'm sure that the outcome will be good uh, and we, we, ju we, we just need to, uh, to get on. And, the, and as, as I said, I think before to you, the more we focus on uh, the people, on, on, on the people who elect us, on their jobs, their hopes, uh, what they can get out of uh, investment in, in science and technology. The more we talk about uh, the, the, the future that we're trying to build, the less we talk about politics at Westminster. 
the generally happier we will all be. Okay? Uh, thank, Minister, you. Thank, thank you. you thank much. you very much. Thank Thanks. you. If that was down here, will we expect our leaders to be able to put on such a brave face, for better or worse? As much as he was embroiled in scandal, he is not allowing that to derail what little time he has left or to derail the process for the new leader. We will comment on this when we come back, but we have news on the hour, WESN, Talking Point will return. Stay tuned. Seven is out. All day is in. WESN News on the hour. Every day we communicate through stories. Stories of ourselves, our challenges, our goals, our experiences, and our aspirations. Storytelling is an art, an art that we have mastered. WESN Film Studios comprises a collaborative team of experts with extensive industry experience locally, regionally, and internationally. The ability of your business to successfully communicate with your preferred audience depends on the strength of the stories you tell. Your vision should be communicated in a high quality, professional and creative way. From concept to post-production, advertising to film, multi-camera productions, live events, streaming and virtual conferencing, we are WESN Film Studio. Let your own unique voice be heard and your vision realized. Call us today at 628-5835 for your next production. Join me, Sule A. Joseph, as I delve into the day-to-day -day psychological issues plaguing our society. We will discuss behaviours that encompass the biological influences, social pressures and environmental factors that affect how you think, act and feel. Sight. Thursdays at 11am, only on WESN, Content Capital. I am Rondell Donoa, attorney at law and host of Strictly Legal on WESN Content Capital. Strictly Legal is a legal program geared towards informing you, the public, of your legal rights, responsibilities, and remedies. So be viewing Thursdays, 10 a.m. to 10.30 a.m. A reminder from WESN, we urge you to protect yourself and others from the spread of COVID-19. Stay safe by taking some simple precautions. Clean your hands often. Use soap and water or an alcohol-based hand rub. Maintain a safe distance from anyone who is coughing or sneezing. Wear a mask. Don't touch your eyes, nose or mouth. Cover your nose and mouth with your bent elbow or a tissue when you cough or sneeze. Stay at home. If you have a fever, cough and difficulty breathing, seek medical attention. Following the above can help us all to help each other. Welcome back to Talking Point, ladies and gentlemen, and of course, we're going to open up the phone lines. And, um, but first, I have to ask my compatriots with regards to the video, because, uh, uh, Camille, I'll start with you. Quick, 
we, we got the sense that, yes, there's a, there's a good amount of dignity here that we, 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 to be honest, cannot necessarily expect from how locally our politicians operate on all sides, I guess you should say at this point. But there might be some, you know, self-serving reasons for it. He might actually be trying to keep a door open so his political career might not actually be over. Well, well, that's it. If you know the story of Boris Johnson, how he got to where he is, and his dreams, even as a child, you understand why he is behaving and uh, caring about himself in the manner that he is, even in the face of mounting pressure for him to resign, as he has. But even after what he still, as you said, have to, he has to keep that door open. So he is going to be very, very dignified and measured in terms of his approach because he is still before the people of, 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 the, U, of the UK. Uh, that's something that we've kind of speculated and see locally, right? Politicians I, don't want to leave. I, I, and, and fair enough. My only thing is, is where I would differ is that, yes, he's going to make a return, but I don't think it will be to the Conservative Party. I don't necessarily uh, see that. A different uh, party? Perhaps a, a different party on independent candidate. You, you have to realize that to, to a certain extent, we must understand that there is still a level of popularity associated with Boris Johnson, mostly because of his conservative styles and especially with pushing through Brexit. However, yes. though that may be the case, I cannot see after such a major downfall and with the resignation of over 50 members of the conservative cabinet, him returning to the conservative party. So. There are chances that he will return, but not necessarily I, through I, the Conservative Party. I actually disagree. I don't think he would go through another party because for all intents and purposes, you're still fighting over the same exact voters. So you're basically trying to split the party at that point and rebuild it in your own image. And that might not be necessary. You might just more or less be able to do that if you win internally anyway. But you're speaking about his choice. I'm speaking about the Conservatives Party's choice and whether I, I, they, will, they will actually allow him to be on, in that position again. Well, I mean, it all depends on the voters, I guess, at that point. Because you remember, as mentioned in that video, it's not the people of the United Kingdom that choose who's going to be the next year of the, no, the Conservative In this party. case, in, in, I get in, it. In yes. any case, but well, they, they right. will choose who the Prime Minister is. And, and that's how it works generally with parties, political parties. But I also want to mention, because the phone lines are open now, ladies and gentlemen, you can call in and join us in Talking Point. We have a question of the day, but as usual, um, if there are any thoughts or opinions on the situations that are taking place in TNT that you'd like to comment on, we're always open and willing to hear that, to have that discussion. But the other part of it is that uh, we, we mentioned Sri Lanka earlier. This is the worst economic situation Sri Lanka has faced. And mind you, Sri Lanka went through a civil war that only ended in 2009. Huh? That civil war ended very recently. This is the worst economic situation that Sri Lanka has faced since gaining independence from the United Kingdom in 1948. And that's a huge, huge thing considering Sri Lanka's turbulent history post-independence. So, you know, bear that in mind as well. And as we mentioned, if the United Kingdom could be facing this, well, people might think that, and it goes back to what Kemi was stating, people might think that we may be selfish or it may be unreasonable to be having these discussions and, and painting Trinidad to be in such a negative manner. But i just like to let you know, no longer are we going to hide from the realities. No longer are we going to hide from the truth. Because quite frankly, we will be playing victims by our own cause if we are doing that. Sean, please give them the question of the day. Folks, considering the various global conditions leaving other nations in turmoil, is TNT just plain lucky to persevere through turbulent times? And these times, you, you might say, well, are we really persevering? Look at Sri Lanka, look at Haiti, um, and even to some extent, look at the UK. So we're not so bad. Other places are worse. We could be doing better, maybe. And I think therein lies the, therein lies the problem. If you think we could be doing better, just who, how, where, what are we supposed to be doing? Who's supposed to be doing it? That is that better. Are we just lucky, therefore, that things are not worse? Kimio, uh, this is a very interesting debate to have, actually, whilst we're waiting for this. Are we just it, share dumb luck? 
it, it goes beyond a lot of things because yes, we should be doing better as a nation, but how, how much longer are we going to count on luck? How much luck do we have? How do you even count luck? It's 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 a matter of there are so many things in general, so many issues that our our success our success um successive government should have should have dealt with really and truly. When you look at simple things in terms of the way in which we live, public transport, healthcare, education, simple, simple, very, very simple issues that government make hard for the people for absolutely no reason. And it's simply that if we if we don't recognize that we have gotten substandard and and nothing of 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 of, of power even of excellent over the years from from governments yes governments have done things for us over the years as 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 a nation but where we are right now we are supposed to be much more advanced than where we are in many areas in terms of our agriculture in terms of of our exports in terms of investment in terms of just how we do things in Trinidad and Tobago, what we receive is not is not of of of, of anything to be thankful for, anything to be grateful for really and truly. I'm sorry to say it like that. And we keep depending on our leaders and saying yes, they have the best interest, but they really and truly they don't have the best interest. Our our infrastructure should be more advanced. Most of the flyovers in the country, as far as if my memory is correct, or at least a significant amount of them were built before I was born, or, or close to my birth, or, or well in the past, right? As opposed to, I mean, look how long it took just to get that one lane turning right to go towards San Fernando from the highway, right? Um, so one area about luck, here's the thing. We had this whole disaster prepared, this cabinet team of like five ministers, and everything was mobilized, and nothing happened. Right? We, we are so lucky, we don't even know how to keep maintaining that level of preparedness Whoa. because of a little bit of rain over the weekend and flood out and we ain't heard nothing from that, from that team and the local government minister since. I, I just, just to I, I, add, oh, hold on a Camille because we have to go to some callers, but I just want to <laughs> add to what both of you had said. Uh, we're celebrating 60 years of independence this year. <laughs> just, just adding that to what you're listening, 60 years. We, we have a caller on the line with us, though, from Diggle Martin. Good morning, caller. Hello. Good morning. Hello. Hello. Good morning. morning, gentlemen. Good morning, Tim. Yeah, I just want to say that Trinidad being a small island country, you know, and in the Caribbean in general, all our nations are not as large. But the one good advantage that we have, we have, you know, like our foreign exchange, we have a certain amount that that helps see us out if used wisely. Our Heritage and Civilization Fund, as far as I know, that is fairly sizable. But over the years, um, we should really should have had things in a better way than we are now. But the fact remains that they have to have good food on management now. If we don't do it from now, we're going to find ourselves in some problems later along the road. But I, I don't think we are very seriously thinking of any kind of problem like drunk or that sort of thing. Because I think we, we were fairly good managed over the years, but we could have done a lot better with the money that passed through the island and the country. Thank you, guys, and have a good morning, and thank you for taking my call. Thank you very much, Kola. We have a call on the line with us from Shugonas. Good morning, Kola. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Morning, morning. <laughs> As regards your question of the day, the answer is obvious. We're more than lucky. <laughs> we have done everything to destroy our economy. Mm. We have destroyed our tax system, which was one of the best in the world, been a progressive system of taxes, which favor the poor at the expense of the rich. And we do the opposite to favor the rich at the expense of the poor. We have closed down a very profitable refinery with everybody sidestepping the question. And uh, it's only because Trinidadians are nice people that we continue to survive. Our real problem, as I have maintained all the time, is we do not enforce our law. The linchpin is the annual administrative report. And my discussions with your guest yesterday proved that because he said he was not at the level to see the administrative report. 
the administration report is for everybody. In my sure. division, when we had to review it three months before, we would have the each section putting up proposals or amendments to the last one. And if somebody at his level don't know, it means that there is no administrative report being adhered to. And that is the basis of government. That is to see you enforce your law. Mm -hmm. We have a gate falling down and killing our 13 year old or what? Did that have planning permission? Well, we had well. some time with this rich plane where the police went up there mm -hmm. and lick up somebody, makeshift masjid. masjid. Did that masjid have planning permission? We have today a number of these religious bodies are spotted up with some dubious buildings, no parking provided, and they're blocking all the roads and whatnot. And that is, we're more than lucky to be surviving. I yeah. don't know if that answers your question or if you need any food. No, of course. That, that, yeah, that, that's wonderful. We have, we have a, other callers, but thank you very much, <laughs> Professor. Good hearing from you. Take care. No, uh, people might get upset for him mentioning um, the gate falling on the 16-year-old boy as well as the masjid because it's, it's, it's religious, it's sacred. But he has a very, very good point. And you have to really listen to what the professor was stating, especially in relation to planning. Because as much as the PCA may point at wrongdoing to the police, and by all means, I'm, I'm, I'm happy that they've actually concluded this investigation very fast and put things in place. But does the master have permission and is there any sort of planning permission that was rubber stamped that allowed it to be there? Bear that in mind as well. Call on the line with us um, from Shagonis. Good morning, caller. Hello, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Peter um, Shah and Camille. And Sean. Fixing Trinidad's economy should start with recognizing that the manufacturing sector contributes to 15% of GDP. And who owns the manufacturing sector? The one percenter. The rest of the GDP is owned by the government through PSIP spending and through state enterprises implementation. Now, if the population do not own the GDP, there is no stimulus for the population to be productive and, 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 and grow the economy despite any problems. The other thing is look at an economy like Norway, where they are the second richest people in the world with $82,000 per capita. And they started with a fishing economy. Mm -hmm. But when they discovered oil, they made it law that 50% of the oil revenue must stay in Norway, not, not the, the multinationals coming in with less fair invitation to invest and take it out. Mm -hmm. And when the stabilization fund was created, they made it law that no government coming into power could take the stabilization fund. They could, they could probably use some of the interest on the stabilization fund. And Norway's stabilization fund is 1.3 trillion US dollars. And with an economy like ours, we could start to look at what other countries did. They focus on education and they focus on productivity. Most of the Norway people never talk about an eight hour work day. In fact, the hardest working and most productive people in the world today is, is Norwegian, Caller. Scandinavian type. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I want to add to what you're saying. Huh? Also, I want to add to what you're saying. The most educated people in the world today is Norway. Yeah. What, what you're also okay. stating, very good point, because Norway has also some of the highest taxes in the world per capita, and the people actually don't mind paying it. They have no problem, they don't complain about paying it, simply because... Yeah, that, that is true. Yeah. They have the highest tax. All right. Simply because of the benefits they get in return. Simply because they know the taxation they're paying is worth it because of the returns, and because they actually could survive and live off of what they're earning. So it's a good point, caller. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Carla. Thank you, Carla, for that. Um, yes, uh, Norway is the example of what could have been. Other places like our neighbor, right to the western south, are examples of what we, we, we seem to be heading towards if we're not careful. I think the first two callers, they, kind of, they do agree with each other. Management, the annual report's not being done. 
management could turn it around if we start now. We, we, you know, we, we can't just say, well, because we badly managed, let's just continue being badly managed. Call on the line with us from Pretty Valley. Good morning, Colo. Good, good morning, Joe and Kito. Good morning. And, um, the next guy. Camille. 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 Samuel, yes. yeah. Um, I don't think um, we reached the point, Trinidad and Tobago reached the point of Sri Lanka, Venezuela, and Cuba just yet. Mm -hmm. I think um, we, um, I wouldn't say some people being ungrateful, I wouldn't use that word, but I think we should be still a little grateful to our country. I show all three of you all there, if I'm not mistaken, benefit from gate. Mm -hmm. We still could go to um, free hospital. Mm -hmm. yeah. My um, father-in-law just went for cataract um, surgery and just the other guy in two weeks. You know, so I think we, um, the comparison you all are making is um, we have to watch ourselves do things um, properly before we, we get there, but I don't think Trinidad and Tobago economy is um, just there yet. We are subsidized for gas. We go full up our tank for gas. We just said we are going to cut the subsidy. Everybody is um, bawling and complaining, but we subsidize for gas. Yes. Mm -hmm. So to, to, to close my point, I don't think we reach there yet. Uh, to those countries, you're the example you're showing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. And, 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 and Kola, because Camille and Sean have to make points too. Um, we, we're not, just, just to clarify, we're not saying that we've actually reached those yet. Yes. We're just pointing out the, the similarities and the tenets to how these nations ended up to be. The behaviors that got them there, we run the risk of repeating. Camille, I've silenced you long enough, my friend. I do <laughs> apologize. I was actually intended to say the same thing um, which you just clarified for the callers. Not that we're saying we're at this point, is neither is it that we're saying we're, we're not grateful for what we have, neither is it that we're saying we're not grateful for GATE because we all would have benefited from GATE and other plans and programs by um, administrations over the years. But what, is, what we're really saying is that if we're not careful and if we're not um, cognizant of the examples and the things which would have happened in other nations, we run the risk of falling into the same trap. And I think it is that over the years, we understand that other nations have, have made, some, made similar mistakes and we uh, just continue to go down the same path. Mm -hmm. I, one thing to point out, yes, there are good success stories with our public health system and there are good success stories with our education system. However, I think one of the problems is though, it's still not necessarily being managed properly. So we have square pegs in a lot of round holes and it doesn't always work out. Some of the pegs are, are around as well, not all of them. Um, so it's one of the things with management to try to get the system to be more efficient as we run out of resources or, res or, or things get tighter. I think we have a caller on the line with us. I want to go back to the first caller and what he stated with our Heritage and Civilization Fund and, and Foreign Exchange Reserve. But I think we have a caller on the line with us. Good morning, caller. Hello, good morning. Yeah, hey, good morning. Um, Keaton good morning. Small and um, Simeon. Good morning. Yeah, we had a good foundation. <laughs> what happened? Oh, boy. Phone companies again. Call Can't say TSTV because we don't know which phone company it is. Call us from Claxton Bay. We do apologize. We, we hope that you can call us back call as us the phone back. Call us back. open for the next couple of minutes. Keaton, Sean, and Kemuel here. We're looking forward to talking to you. Um, <laughs> going back to what the first caller mentioned uh, in relation to the Heritage, uh, Heritage and Civilization Fund as well as our foreign exchange reserves. Caller, remember, you know, we, we, we have a... a a fairly decent uh, foreign exchange reserve right now, but bear in mind that was really boosted up uh, due to. Uh, if my mate, slip, slip me now. The, um, the, the IMF yes. special drawing, right? The special drawing, yes. Right? The SDRs. Yes. Right? But, but, but also from the loans. Huh? Loans, when we, right. when we got loans to pay for things internally, the foreign exchange wasn't used. They converted it. Right. And adding to that, Remember, Sri Lanka had very, very healthy foreign exchange reserves as well. Around the same amount. And uh, more than us. More than us. Right, the tourism sector. Exactly. So, so we have to bear that in mind. So it goes into management, but we can't just you know, say that we have it. We're going to use it out because in relation to the Heritage and Stabilization Fund, we haven't made a deposit. When was the last time we made a deposit? I We've made four withdrawals since 2019. I think the caller that, that, that spoke about Scandinavia, one of the points he, that he made with regards to no incentive for the 
basically the working class, you could say, because ownership is basically the very rich on government, to, to really build towards something. I, I, yes, we see small business owners, but like, where really is the new business coming from in TNT and productivity levels? I think at the end of the day, yeah, we, uh, that, that's what separates a lot of nations and nations like the Scandinavian ones and the Southeast Asian ones. You can't, like, our productivity is just not the same. Because I think it's Singapore. Singapore doesn't have oil. Singapore doesn't have gold. Singapore actually has no, no natural resources, so much so that they import they, water. They worked themselves into prosperity. Yes, they very much so. imported water to drink Singapore. So bear that in mind. But call a firm from Claxton Bay. We lost your call. Um, uh, so call us back. We're still waiting uh, for you to call. Uh, right, but we, we only do, have a couple of minutes. We do apologize, though, if, if you're affiliated with uh, TSTT because we're very much oh, boy, aware and we, of the situation and, and we too have been experiencing it. Yeah, it's they, very yet to remedy our they, situation they, in its they entirety. Are, they are other unreliable phone companies and telecommunication companies in the, in the island. And in yet the, they're still, the twin islands, they're still more reliable. I don't know about that one. They're still yes, more I don't know about that one. Kemuel, you please know, correction. You, hold on, Kemuel. Yes, he's, he's correct. No. Nah. No. I have had he's more correct. reliability on other net. Oh, good. We're starting this debate this morning. Kemuel, when, you know, you will experience what I'm talking about. I don't necessarily want to call them out, but you and all should know telecommunications, not just phone lines. Yes, sir. In this office, we have more than one axe to grind with more than one company. Well, okay, fine. So, ah. uh, 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 okay, ah. I, will, I will not argue with that. That is a fair point. I am just stating that based off of my experience, it seems as though we've had different experiences. And, and, and look at that. Productivity again. Where is the cream rising from the top? Sometimes, because I've said this before with politics, it seems more that it's a race to the bottom, not just in the political sector, but also sometimes in the private sector. Who wants to stand out? You don't, you know, outside of a few examples in the private sector, you don't really see anybody trying to stand out. They just want to, the banks, they just all want to have the same interest rates, the same, the same devices, the same marketing, the same whatever. Let's start another debate yeah. within the last two minutes. Do banks in Trinidad and Tobago, or anywhere for a matter of fact, actually care about their customers or the people that they serve? Or, I mean, the short answer is no. I mean, I mean... <laughs> just example, one bank, I wouldn't call the name, obviously, that, that doesn't have uh, toilet facilities for their, their, their clients. Oh, Oh a major my. bank. Yeah, yeah, they don't even have toilet facilities. They said that's for the staff. And if you have to use toilet, you have to go to KFC. Oh, oh really? Yeah. Now we have to look up uh, which bank is nearest to KFC, any location across Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you very well, much. Well, it's, it's, not, it's not the one in Port of Spain, but <laughs> it's, it's in Arima. <laughs> no, well, listen, the, the other aspect is, is that in TNT now, you are a paying just for, com uh, some individual was telling me yesterday, I don't want to call the name on air, that they went to um, get their license renewed, right? Renewed. Um, he had issues with, in relation to his documents because the utility bill didn't have his name on it. It has mom's name on it, but his mom was deceased. It was in probate, blah, blah. Long story short, he was able to get a document, her death certificate, of which he had on his phone. His significant other sent it to him from home. He had it on his phone. They told him, well, we don't support iPhones here, so you're going to have to email it to us, and it's going to be $10 for us to access it via email, and another what? $10 for us to print it. Oh, that's nonsense. Right? Yeah, that's, that's, that's nonsense. So, because if, they, if they've moved up to a place of having online appointment system, and the claim that licensing is now digitized, or one of the more advanced in terms of digitization, and that's what they are being told, then that's, that's poor. How, how, what is the operating cost of an email? Emails don't even have a cost to create. Emails do not even have a monetary value to create, much less operate. I made a, 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 a Gmail account for myself for a function and then realized that it was unnecessary. Did it cost me anything? No. I just have an extra email account now that's just there. How are you charging people to access an email that is sent to them? 
seems as though a person just wanted something to eat or drink and they did that ten dollars and that is why they said you have to pay us ten dollars i don't know i mean that is a, a microcosm of government corruption all right hold on before you start we have to end it there I mean, <laughs> before you start, we have to end it there. Public sector reform. Camille Pascal, Simeon, my friend, thank you very much for joining us once more. Thank Camille, you so very you. much. Um, it was my pleasure as always. And just for us in Trinidad to be able to recognize and understand the situations that are wrong, you will understand how it affects us in Trinidad to And understand we could be heading down a similar route if we don't pay attention, if we aren't careful in terms of how we manage what we have. Certainly, and Mr. Shaw Michael Small, very much so. We have to realize the situation now. If we didn't realize it before, we're, we're leaving it kind of late, but at least there's still opportunity for us to rectify the situation. Just realize our brand new airport, hey, another airline is saying, Well, we're not starting back flights to Port of Spain just yet. Much less. That, which much airline less, is that? No, oh, sorry, now. Oh, wonderful. And, yeah, and, and, we had to wait till December. We had to wait for we had to wait for a few months before they'll consider starting. And, and by the way, that's a loss of income to Piaco because the, the the prices that planes have to pay in order to land and to even and uh, remain here while passengers are disembarking and uh, you know all that is part of it. But anyway, I'm Keaton Shaw. Thank you once more. Remember, though the depre uh, the oh my God, though the depression might be depressing, though the conversation <laughs> might be depressing. I mean, it's not like Heinz there. You know? Oh my word. Yeah, I should just end it there, you know. <laughs> no, the, the conversation may be depressing. Remember, today is a good day to have a good day. Ironic, but we'll see you again tomorrow morning. Bye-bye.